HMS Vanguard was one of the three St. Vincent-class battleships of the 1907 estimates, which were similar to the preceding Dreadnought and Bellerophon classes, with some differences, notably in armament and slight size and speed changes. Vanguard, although one of the older Dreadnoughts that the Royal Navy had in service at the outbreak of the Great War, was still a valuable ship and joined the other battleships in Scapa Flow in August of 1914, where much like other Royal Navy Dreadnoughts we have discussed on this channel, she went about the normal fleet drills and participated in the Battle of Jetland as part of the 4th Division. However, unlike other dreadnoughts we have talked about, Vanguard was not sold for scrap, refitted, or sold to another nation. Instead, on the 9th of July, 1917, for exact reasons that still remain a mystery, Vanguard blew up and completely disappeared in a matter of moments. Out of the 800 men on board, only two survivors managed to live through one of the largest disasters in Royal Navy history. When it comes to discussing a controversial subject like the destruction of Vanguard, a disclaimer is in order. The information I will present on this subject will come from the sources I have posted in the description, and as always, I will try my best to present factual information regarding this subject. On July 9th, 1917, it was a very routine day in Scapa Flow. Small craft, including destroyers, patrolled the large natural anchorage to ensure no enemy vessels, including submarines, entered Scapa Flow to cause harm to the large ships of the surface fleet. Scapa Flow had changed a lot in the three years of war and before. Going from a desolate island outpost guarded by local territorial army members with four small mobile guns, whose civilian occupation made them unavailable. The great majority of the men are unable to attend camp owing to the fact that the training season coincides with the season of heron fishing, upon which their livelihood depends. As a report from the War Office describes, Even at the outbreak of the war, Scapa Flow was not ready to host so many vessels, as the small base did not have the proper facilities to house so many men and supply them and their ships. It also didn't help Scapa was not connected to the mainland by rail, meaning that supplies had to be brought by ship. This meant for the time being the Commander-in-Chief of the Grand Fleet, Admiral John Jellico, had his ships at sea training, as he saw it as a better defense than sitting in what was essentially an unprotected harbor. By 1917, many things had changed in Scapa, like a new Commander-in-Chief, Admiral David Beatty, and accommodations had improved, as James Mark Miller describes in his book Scapa. For most of the war, the capital ships of the Grand Fleet swung around their anchor chains. Life aboard fell into a routine of shipkeeping, and in Scapa Flow, time could hang heavily among the crews cooped up on the water. Officers devised training exercises and entertainment to break the tedium and laid out a golf course on Flotta. Trips ashore were limited but highly prized. The seamen had plenty to eat. Some culinary adventurers came up with seagull stew, reputed to taste like fishy chicken, and the rum ration must have been a bright punctuation mark in the day's routine. Then there were the shipboard tradesmen, tailors, barbers, shoemakers, who plied their business for the benefit of their shipmates, and despite the prohibition on gambling, those who ran flourishing crown and anchor schools. This was the environment HMS Vanguard was in during the afternoon of July 9th, as the ship was practicing abandoned ship procedures. These drills were intended to make sure the crew was prepared in case of emergency, as large Royal Navy vessels had gone down in the war. Several battle cruisers at Jetland had gone down due to German gunnery and the mishandling of cordite. Granted, in those cases, events had happened quicker than the crews could react, but probably more prudent to the drills at hand was the sinking of HMS Audacious in 1914. The ship was heading to practice gunnery off the coast of Ireland when she struck a German mine and went down several hours later, being the only Royal Navy dreadnought lost to enemy action during the Great War. Within several hours after the completion of these drills, Vanguard would resemble the likes of Queen Mary or Invincible. While the crew was conducting these drills and finishing up at around 5 p.m., the ship dropped anchor near the north shore of Scapa Flow, coming to a complete stop at roughly 6.30 p.m. The ship had her boilers running during this time and continued to run for a time. Even though it was wartime, a lot of the doors were open that were meant to be closed. The thought was that the ship was in home waters inside the most patrolled and protected port the Royal Navy had. The order to close these doors for the night was given at 8.30, and all seemed well with the ship. Nighttime routines were beginning, with some of Vanguard's officers leaving the ship, attending a concert on the theater ship Gorku anchored beside the Royal Oak. One of them was midshipman R.F. Nicholas, who in October 1939 was second in command on the same Royal Oak, again escaping death in dramatic circumstances. While away from the ship, one can assume Nicholas at around 11.30 that night heard a tremendous explosion, which turned out to be the ship he served on. To take from R.A. Burt's British battleships of World War I, from the 
From the many varying accounts given by witnesses aboard nearby ships, it would seem that smoke was seen to issue forth from the area just below the foremast. After a short interval, a heavy explosion was accompanied by an enormous sheet of flame, after which the ship became enveloped in dense smoke. Second explosion followed the first and greatly increased the flame area. But the precise location of this eruption was never determined because of the dense smoke. Some eyewitnesses claimed a third explosion, but this was considered to have been rumblings within the moving hull. One witness said that he noticed some alterations in Vanguard's trim, but as he was the only one to claim positively that he had seen this ship explode, his evidence was received with a certain amount of skepticism. No one witnessed the sinking of the ship. The general consensus of the witnesses was that the explosion had occurred within the vicinity of P and Q 12-inch turrets, probably in the magazines, of which we'll get into in a bit. A large amount of debris was thrown up into the air, and when it came down, it landed on HMS Bellerophon and other surrounding battleships. In the sources that I've looked at, there seems to be a disparity in how many men were on board at the time of the explosion. Some put it closer to 800 and others 850, so it's safe to say at least 800 men were on board. Of those men, three survived the explosion, however, one would succumb to his wounds, and the other two would recover. Following the explosion and a disaster of this scale, a board of inquiry was set up to try to find out what happened to the ship. Now, this board came up with three possibilities, one or more of which could occur. The first being negligence on the part of the officers in charge of cordite stowage. Two, ashes from boilers being placed against adjacent bulkheads of either P or Q magazines. Or three, enemy action either by U-boat or saboteur placing a slow-fused bomb aboard. Before we continue into the board's findings, I'd like to spend some more time looking at the possibilities they suggested. In regards to the first, negligence when it comes to cordite stowage, even before the war, this problem was noted, as an emphasis was put on gunnery speed, with a faster rate of fire being preferred over careful calculation. This obsession with speed led to unsafe practices like stacking of ammunition outside protective magazines and leaving anti-flash doors open during drills or battle. Previously, Royal Navy ships had similar incidents like the cruiser Natal, which caught fire and sank quickly in Cromedy Firth, or the pre-dreadnought Bulwark, which went down in a similar incident. Of course, more famous incidents like the mishandling of cordite silk bags happened at Jutland with the battlecruisers, under the command of Admiral David Beatty. It should be noted that Beatty was part of the Speed School, although not everyone was in the Royal Navy. Jellicoe had taken steps to try to curb the unsafe ammunition handling in the battleships, but this was easier said than done, as individual captains of the ships tended to follow their own rules in this regard. A prime example of this is Agincourt, who fired 144 total rounds of her 12-inch guns at Jutland. Even in Beatty's flagship at the time of Jutland, Lion, steps were being taken to curb the excessive amounts of powder stored outside the magazine by Warrant Officer Alexander Grant, who had come from the Grand Fleet and was not popular due to his actions of actually storing cordite properly. Because of it, it probably saved Beatty at Jutland, when Lyon suffered the hit that caused the destruction of Q-Turret. After the losses of Invincible, Queen Mary, and Indefatigable, and the damage to other ships including Lyon, committees were set up to investigate what happened to the ships, and it was determined that the ships were sunk by heavy shells, but with the stacking of cordite, each turret became its own magazine, and it was clear that the practice should not continue as it was putting the ships at great risk if they were hit. Even though it was recommended that the practice should not continue, with Beatty taking command of the Grand Fleet in December 1916 and the independence of the captains and officers of the various dreadnoughts of the Grand Fleet, it can be seen how unsafe practices could be allowed to continue on ships like Vanguard. In the same vein, there is a possibility the cordite on Vanguard was older, and as cordite ages, it becomes less stable. The next possibility of ashes from the boilers being placed against bulkheads could cause powder and P and Q magazines to ignite as we will soon see from the committee's findings. As for enemy action by either U-boat or saboteur, it is possible that a U-boat could have entered Scapa Flow and sunk Vanguard as attempts were made in the First World War to enter the anchorage, and of course the famous sinking of Royal Oak at anchor in Scapa Flow in October of 1939 by U-47. As for a saboteur, this is just my two cents. It's possible as agents of both sides were operating in each other's countries throughout the war, and there are reports of spies in the Second World War in and around Scapa Flow. Those claims are disputed, but it just seems unlikely that a saboteur could get on a battleship, given the remoteness of Scapa Flow and an explosive device going unnoticed. Also, why go for an older dreadnought like Vanguard? She certainly was not as powerful as some of the newer ones like the Iron Dukes, Queen Elizabeths, or Royal Sovereigns. 
The committee began inspecting debris first and found the debris on Bellerophon and the other ships came from the central part of Vanguard, and not near a magazine as some had thought. If, as was thought, one of the magazines had exploded, the gases would have a large venting area through the uptakes in that vicinity so that the plating in the passageways would not have been subjected to great heat, but would have received extreme blast effects. Next, the board asked the surrounding ships to furnish figures showing magazine temperatures at dusk the day of the disaster. The startling fact was that there was no statutory system for logging temperatures. Sometimes the job was left to the chief stoker and his group, and those were only random checks. There was no abnormal temperatures of those ships that had logged temperatures that day. As I mentioned, there were attempts to have safety procedures in place for the magazines, but standard procedures across the Grand Fleet had not been put in place. In the preliminary findings, it was found coal had been stored in the fuel spaces adjoining P and Q handling rooms, and when the hatches were closed, there was little to no ventilation. One of the bulkheads formed a wall against the 4-inch magazines. They state the temperatures rose beyond the normal, and cordite ignited spontaneously. It was noted that there had been a fire aboard Vanguard in one of her coal bunkers in 1914. The cause had not been ascertained. Evidence shows that Vanguard's 4-inch gun deck had been completely closed in by protective mattresses shortly before her loss, and this would have prevented the circulation of air to the magazines and shell spaces. Another critical finding was that the funnel uptakes and ventilation trunking were hardly ever inspected, could frequently become clogged, thus adding more credence to the possibility of the 4-inch magazine having started the explosion. The board found that the loss of the vessel was caused by a fire starting the 4-inch magazine, which quickly spread to either Q or P magazines, setting off the cordite charges therein and destroying the ship. There are other explanations that the board goes into, as they cannot say for certain what caused the destruction of the ship, only what is most likely and no blame was attached to the over 800 men aboard her at the time of the explosion. The wreck of Vanguard is still in Scapa Flow, as it is considered a war grave, and people dive to explore the wreck. Now, I'll try to remember to leave a link to a website to look at the pictures of the wreck in the description. The loss of Vanguard is something that is not as well known as the battlecruisers at Jutland, or even Audacious in 1914. Her loss cannot be 100% determined. However, it is more than likely unsafe practices in handling ammunition and other important safety protocols that were not carried out certainly contributed to her loss. Whatever the case may be, the loss of over 800 men in a ship that was not in action was a tragedy. Hopefully, it showed the Royal Navy that they should learn from their mistakes and not continue such unsafe practices. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and please remember to like and subscribe as it will help the channel to grow. And until next time, my friends, have a great week.